spiritually meaningful life la mm. spiritually meaningful life like i said in the beginning of our you know uh, of our exchange uh, nowadays the the word of mindfulness and the meaning of the spirituality is vastly used around the world but uh, but i think the most important is to have awareness of your body speech and mind first that is the first step when you don't have the awareness of your body and speech and mind first and then any sort of a uh, looking towards the spirituality can can become meaningless you know so i think it is very important to develop in our body in our speech in our mind you know to have a sense of awareness and uh, i think i think that is very important that's the first step the second is that you know uh, there's so many different great philosophers great masters different religion different approach way of giving teachings uh, and i think having the open mindset towards all of it i think is quite important rather than saying that i'm coming from this religion mm. and i'm coming from this traditional background and then you close your mind you know that is not really good you should always question everything that is very important in in order to have a spiritual meaningful life because if you don't question everything then you become a little bit like a blind faith you know mm. the same as so call i'm not religious but yet at the same time so call spirituality and then if you don't have a critical thinking and then if you don't have a doubt or questioning certain things and then you will not find a deeper meaning of happiness within you know so that's my uh, my own understanding last last time machine last allah again i want to uh, deal a little bit further and mm-hmm. ask you uh, what does it mean by enlightenment and can it be achieved by any ordinary people like myself like mm-hmm. who lives every day as a farmer or many people who are a ordinary common man do you think there's a potential for these people to be enlightened as well i i think everybody has a potential to be meaning of you know to reach the enlightenment and i think the perception of the enlightenment has to bring a little bit more closer to our life and that is very important because when we think about the meaning of enlightenment we imagine a buddha you know like a, a yellow bowl on his crown and then radiance and lighting everywhere and speaking multiple language in the multiple realms at the simultaneously at the same time that's what we imagine the meaning of enlightenment uh, in a you know in a traditional way of belief of enlightenment it says and you you know it takes three lifetimes you know but like an example the origin of the dupaka ju lineage goes all the way back to milarepa oh. you know so he achieve enlightenment in a single lifetime you know so i it, i think it really depends on how you reflect to the meaning of life itself because enlightenment is not an object it's not an idea mm. and how you reflect the meaning of uh, renunciation and how you reflect the you know you know the meaning of the time the meaning of life the meaning of suffering and how you reflect and how you react and how you overcome makes the difference you know your final destination because thinking only that everything is suffering everybody can think like that no you know, everybody even even a businessman Listen. have to businessman and woman have to think that time is precious you know the time is precious everybody has that concept is But, is enlightenment and elimination of suffering la yes yes em- elimination of all the suffering and then even the subtle level of ignorance abandoning that you know so as we progress uh, over the time you know the the very existence of the ignorant the very existence of the attachment reduces over the time you know but when you reach to the level of bodhisattva then the level of ignorance is still there but not to the point that where it can change your destiny or your future but when you Less. become enlightenment even to the sub- slightest level of ignorance slightest level of uh, negativity is completely distinguish then you became enlightened awakened one yeah. so so but in our in our life i think the most important is to uh, to to develop a sense of awareness of our how we use our time and how we see our life and what kind of a contribution we can do you know to ourselves towards the society as well as looking after the physical and the mental well-being all these are 
key element, you know, uh, because you cannot just hide yourself and say that I want to become enlightenment. You know, I think some sort of a caring for your physical and the mental well-being is very important. You know, because many people, when they think about the meaning of impermanence, they think as a very much like with sadness. You know, mm. you know, like ah, is everything is impermanent and sad with great sadness. But actually, when you reflect to the meaning of impermanence, you should be even more joyful, more happy, because you realize something, you know, much more greater than before. You know, that's how I overcome my suffering. Because I, you know, gone through a lot of suffering in my life, very intensive suffering. But if I say that ah, everything is karma, everything is impermanent. If I just sit like that and not react and not overcome, I will be still miserable to this day. You know? So how we utilize the Buddhist teaching, not just by belief, but how we utilize it, how we can make ourselves more stronger, more clear, more alive, more human. You know. And that makes us better Buddhist, isn't it? That's yeah. So, Rinpoche, uh, what about the relationship between the enlightened state and somebody who is constantly happy for no reason, for mm. instance? Is there any relationship between the emotions such as the sense awareness of someone being happy? Mm -hmm. And what is the difference between these two? Uh, the difference between these two? Um, are you happy all the time? It seems to be. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the time. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. And the rest of the time I was thinking how happy I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because, uh, you know, many yogis, you know, many yogis, they live your life. You know, they live your life of simplicity. Oh. They, they carry your philosophy which is like the less to do less to think less to think less to worry more closer to the enlightenment oh you know it doesn't go other way around <laughs> <laughs> so i think you have the more right answer than me you know i have a center i have this i have this to worry i have that to worry you know L so, so many yogis you know the very definition of the yogi is a similar concept that you implement uh, you know simpler life means less to do Less to do means less to think. Less to think means less to worry. Less to worry means less projection of thoughts in your mind. Less projection of thoughts in your mind, closer to the non-duality state of mind. Yeah. So that's Very that. interesting, Rimachin. But mm -hmm. I would like to, since uh, you have uh, really shared the whole, whole view on that, mm -hmm. so let me, let me uh, get a glimpse of your insight on this, Rimachin. Let's say, I am constantly happy mm. and all the time everywhere I go I'm just thinking about myself and how happy I am and mm. maybe I'm just locked up myself in that box of self. Mm -hmm. Could that be any, any chances that I could be a chronic narcissist? No, I don't think so. It doesn't seem to be. <laughs> <Let's No. laughs> so, so anyway guys, I, I have this uh, very interesting question to uh, ask to Rinpoche Naula. And in the process of organizing this show, uh, Rinpoche has uh, shared to me explicitly two times or three times that the existence of uh, his life is to help other people. And at this point in time, we have many young people here in the room. At the same time, there are many young people joining online. Yes. And also in our country, you know, we are going through a huge change and uh, there were many transformations happening around the whole, whole of the society, in the uh, bureaucratic system, in our family system, in our individual lives. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, uh, you know, people here do definitely need a lot of support in terms of uh, many many senses. Mm -hmm. And uh, to, to you, Rinpoche, you said that the existence of your life is to help other people. Mm. What does that mean, Rinpoche? What does it mean? Like I have mentioned before, you know, like an example, my approach is that non-traditional, informal way of approach, way of introducing the Buddhism. That is my first step. And, uh, you know, because many people have a misunderstanding about the, the meaning of the Lord Buddha's teaching. And uh, they kind of piled up together with a lot of misconception with the cultural aspect and the traditional aspect and the hierarchical 
a hierarchical uh, aspect and mystical aspect and a superstition aspect you know so my goal and my mission is to you know to bring the lord buddha's teaching more in a realistic level as much as i can and that is uh, you know that's that's the conclusion that i had in my life you know because there's a lot of you know buddhist teachings there's a lot of practice there's a lot of belief but i think very realistic approach is very much needed you know and uh, yeah so because you know people have this imagination that you know when you are rinpoche i cannot speak for other rinpoche you know otherwise i will get lawsuit by them you know <laughs> so you have to be very careful of that you know so i i only speak on myself you know for myself now i'm not speaking for other organization i'm not speaking for other rinpoches i'm not speaking for different traditions just to be clear on that uh you know uh, myself i've gone through a uh, uh, lot of uh, suffering a lot of betrayal a lot of you know tragic uh, here and there can yeah. i can i try to uh, again rephrase the question once more yes, so yes. we can that's all yes, yes. so in terms of like you and you said uh, you want to uh, help others especially mm -hmm. in our country you also mentioned about uh, being being able to guide them or share with them mm -hmm. how to attain more of a mental and physical well-being in mm -hmm. this current time yes uh, would you like to share something on that as well yes yes um you know like i look after my own organization and uh, people have this imagination that you know if you are in pache if you you know your own organization you're always happy and you you have nothing to worry about and you know you're constantly sitting on the shrine and saying that om you know like everything is fine and all in reality that is not true at least in my life you know there's a lot of financial debt you have to handle a lot of legal matter that you have to handle a lot of mismanagement that you handle and then your own personal life that you have to handle as well you know so there's no vacation break time or anything like that and um, um, you know so i think most important that i found out in my own experience is to, is through meditation not so much to do with the prayers and pujas and pujas and prayers i do a lot of pujas and prayers you know i love doing pujas and prayers i memorize in the monastic way of learning you know i carry on that tradition very much hardcore you know nationalist let's put it like this mm -hmm. when it comes to the very traditional aspect but in order to help myself in the mental level it's very important to have an analytical approach you know so if you don't have an analytical approach and only blind faith and saying that i'm going to this temple i'm going to offer a nyandar you know and dar and then you know some some offering and then hopefully it will be fine it does not you know that does have a effect you know in a certain level uh, but that you should, uh, but that you should not fully relied on that you know because like myself i have my own spiritual protector deities that i believe that i worship and so on but in the reality level you have to overcome your own uh, lack of content you have to overcome your anger you have to understand uh, you know the meaning of awareness of your mind and the effect of the other people's behavior towards you you know you have to overcome that in order to have in order to overcome that you need to have an element of the foundation and which is you know breathing exercise meditation that is very important because the more clear mind you have the more clear teaching that you can understand by itself naturally i can guarantee you if you just try to listen to the teaching is you know you cannot understand fully but if you have a calm mind and meditation a little bit like an example the shamatha practice and vipassana practice and that is very very important that you should do and my just personal opinion is that you should not have this idea of that i need to have a guru you know the guru is not going to come and fix your rent you know you have a job problem your guru is not going to come and give you a salary you know he's not going to give you the the visa you know for the traveling purpose you know guru has a limitation you know in your spiritual aspect so you have to come to that conclusion that there's a certain things that you need to fix it by yourself you know and that is by doing a meditation that is by doing you know by practicing by yourself and having a sense of discipline you know that is very important i find and then over the time you can overcome any sort of a mental uh, or external challenges you know 
Yeah. Lesson machine, let's uh, At the same time, ladies and gentlemen who are watching online, uh, if you happen to be here in the town in Timpu, please do come by. You can come in any informal days or dress codes are not very important for now. It's more important that we come together and share time. And even after this live session, Rinpoche would be here around the place for next two hours or so. So you can definitely catch up with Rinpoche if you have any pertinent spiritual questions or questions related to meditation or yoga, niguma yoga or anything that you have in your mind, please do come by. Like we have tea and snacks, we have fruits outside and at the same time we have entertainers here. Even after the live program we may have you know, some time to go on entertaining you all and have a nice time for this weekend. Like. So Rinpoche, uh, maybe I'm asking you too much. Is no, it? please, Lasso. please continue. Lasso, la. Lasso, Rinpoche. So you said that uh, you can help uh, our younger generation mm. in terms of the concepts like meditation, mm. breathing exercises, mm. and then when it comes to the physical uh, well-being, uh, the yoga you have introduced during the fourth Bajrayana conference yes. called the Niguma Yoga yes. that uh, I'm sure many people here have also observed it that time. Mm -hmm. I learned that that is something uh, which already needs very, very strong physical. That's my my perception when, mm -hmm. I, when I observe, when I was seeing yourself performing on the stage. Mm -hmm. And how does it change your own life? And could you like to share a little bit about that? But more in the sense of something more like uh, younger minds can understand, so it can be more a personalized experience of yourself. Yeah, so, you know, I'm, I'm 32 years old right now. Once upon a time, I was also a teenager. So, you know, I was not born yesterday and all of a sudden like a Guru Rinpoche <laughs> out of the lotus, you know, that sort of a thing. Um, but, um, you know, like an example, the definition of the anger you know, definition of the anger, because when you're in my position, you get the criticism for your responsibility, for your decision, uh, and then you try to implement this religious idea that, oh, you know, uh, if they talk bad about me, it's a bad karma for them or whatever, you know, you can think whatever you like to think to make yourself feel better, but that doesn't solve your anger. You're still, <laughs> you're discontent and your anger is still there. So how I overcome uh, my anger and uh, my emotional challenges is to is to look at the very existence of the emotion itself and that's how you overcome the quickest. If it is not comfortable, it is not easy, but that's how you overcome. If you try to avoid it, then it will accumulate just like the disease in our body. Mm. You know, you try to ignore it. For first day you can ignore it, second day you can ignore it. And then you will reach to the point that even the doctor cannot heal it, you know. So like that, you know. So in the in the spiritual dharmic aspect, you have to look at the very existence of the anger. When you say that, uh, Fama Sanjay, yourself, you know, you will never say something really harmful to me because he's a happy person. Uh, uh, but let's say that I'm very jealous of your happiness. You know, I'm so jealous of your happiness. Okay, so I'm very jealous that he looks very happy than the spiritual religious figure. You know, so then I examine the very existence of the jealousy. Then do I believe that jealousy exists in Farmer Sanjay? Is it the chair? Is it his magnificent beard? Yeah. <laughs> is it his radiance, charismatic? Uh, you know, so or is it? The word that he described it, the way he described about me, you know, so you examine the very existence of the jealousy, you come to the conclusion that jealousy does not exist in that person's mind, nor in his body. It existed in yourself. And then when you come to the conclusion that the jealousy existed here in my mind, and then you have to examine a little bit more further, you know, and then as you examine the jealousy more further, and then, you, you know, you can... Uh, disintegrate step by step, step by step, step by step. You cannot finish everything in one session, and it takes time. You know, let's say that your parents have done something terrible to you in your life. You can never forgive them for what they have done to you. Uh, you know, or like an example, like abuse, betrayal, misuse, um, or say something about you that was not true. You know, so so you have this pain. You cannot really 
talk about it because you have to respect them because that's a conservative society you know you have to show that you are always with together as a family you cannot really rebel you know like an example if you look down in temple you know of course the the furthest punk you can uh, see is probably a tour jeans you know there's no a proper punk with the <laughs> with you no know, with the spiky hair you know and and you know in in western country you know when you when you are like uh, you know kicked out from your family in the age of 16 or even 14 you know and then the whole personality is like very rebellious you know and uh, not really conservative mindset in bhutan the furthest you know rebellious you know a characteristic that you can witness is probably a tour jeans here and there a little bit of chain here and there and that that's the furthest thing i have witnessed you know so we ha we, we we are very much like a very conservative society but regardless whether you are you know coming from the very evolved uh, modern society or whether you are from the conservative society as a human being we function exactly the same you know you cannot say that we are conservative society so we handle it better no you cannot say that we as an emotional human being we face exactly the same the anger and the jealousy and the betrayal and the hate so therefore you have to examine the very existence of the jealousy the very existence of the hatred you have to examine that again and again but in order to develop that strength you know you need a source of energy to examine in order to have that strength and that energy to examine is to meditate if you have a meditation not as a belief in the deity but meditation like an example you have a, such a beautiful landscape you know you have a beautiful landscape uh, you know like the peak of the mountains you know so then you can just sit over there you look at the peak of the mountain nothing beyond that nothing before that just looking at the peak of the mountain and if you see a beautiful river and just simply listen to the sound of the river without ha having any sort of a judgment you know without sort of any fear without any desire without any judgment past nor future just simply present and that's how you train your mind to be more calm and to be clear and then when uh, when this um, uh, challenges of uh, emotional struggle arises in your mind then you can develop you know you can use that clarity of concentration to overcome that uh, eventually you know so that's how you can uh, overcome you know step by step but it takes a few session in the beginning you cannot even imagine you hate that person you know even in a traditional aspect you know when we take a refuge you know to the buddha dharma sangha you know even in the traditional text it says very clearly imagine your family and the people you like you know between right and left on your side when you take a refuge people oh. you don't like a little bit further away you know far away then as your mind and the quality develops with the kindness and compassion then you can visualize them more closer oh. you know so uh, so that's that's just my you know small uh, method that i'm offering last lot of thank you la and also just to open up the floor to you all anybody can just raise your hand and if you have any questions please please come in any time la also rimuchi if you also want to ask anything to the audience we are free la okay depending into the question then i'll ask them the question Lasula, that, that, okay. So in that case, uh, Rimuchi, I still have a, a follow-up question for you, la. Okay. So, uh, so like I said in the in the beginning itself, you are like a, a Buddha avatar for many of us. Here. Avatar. Yes, la, avatar. Okay. Yes, la. Yes, la. <laughs> okay. Yes, la, yes, la. Okay. And the, personally, when I met you, <laughs> I had that sense of awareness, like okay. which I never had before, la. Okay. So, so I have to be the airbender. <laughs> <laughs> yes, la, yes, la. Okay. So you're the whole package, Rupa Okay, got it. <laughs> Thank you, la. Okay. okay. But you were, like you said, you were not born as this person. Yeah. You were born as a baby, as, yeah. a, as a human being. Yeah. And with all these great teachings that you have received so many practices that you have gone through and also so many uh, experiences you had in mm. the process mm. uh, which is very difficult to see the human side in you. La. Mm. But for the, uh, for the record, for all the audience and even for myself, mm. would you like to share, uh, share your human story, Rinpoche? Which is not as Rinpoche, but a human story of yourself. La. Okay. Human story of myself. 
including if there's any law of course you always give teaching or meet people for how to eradicate their their suffering or mm -hmm. their problems and their situations mm -hmm. do you have your own problem situations as human do you have like any of us here in the room i read somewhere that all of us whether we agree or not we have traumas mm -hmm. we have abuse as we grow up mm, yes but it's the only difference that one has to realize and ex accept it. Mm -hmm. So we'd like to hear your human story, if you have any uh, traumas, if you have any uh, situations that you'd like to share to young people, mm -hmm. so that many people who came here mm -hmm. also would be able to relate to you and mm -hmm. you know, take a path on your mm -hmm. direction as well. Okay. So just bear with me before I start. Uh, you see, There was a lot, lots of ups and downs in my life, uh, you know, so, hmm? yes? So where were you born? La? Can, you, can you tell us about, a little bit about your... Yes. Let's la, let's la. Um, I was born in India. Okay. Yeah, I was la. born in India, but, you know, my parents, they are Bhutanese, you know, so, so I became a Bhutanese, you know. <laughs> you know. Uh, so that's that. Um, when I was a few years old, uh, you know, I was recognized by, you know, different masters and saying that you are Kalurumbache reincarnation and, uh, and, you know, saying that you have a great future, you have a big responsibilities and, you know, and put me on a very high throne, you know. When I look back, it's quite embarrassing because I was sitting on the throne, you know, I was falling asleep, you know. <laughs> Meanwhile, they were telling other people, saying that Kalurumbache is a reincarnation and then, you know, of a great master. And uh, it's quite embarrassing when I look back. But uh, there was a there was a lot of um, uh, different uh, stages in my life where where I was living like a prince until the age of seven, um, because it was you know my late father. He was the the nephew of the previous Kalurumbuche and also the head of the whole organization of the Kalurumbuche. So I was I was living like a prince until the age of seven, you know. Like an example, you know, uh, wherever I go, there was always an escort by him, you know, and by the lamas and then other people constantly, day and, you know, day and night. And uh, also not studying, obviously, you know, I could tell the teacher when I want to study and when I don't want to study. To that extent, I was a very, very spoiled uh, kid. Um, but, Still, you know, uh, you know, there was constantly a dharma connection, constantly being in the monastery and being in the temple and so on. That was never part of, you know, out of my life. That was always part of my life. But then when I was uh, seven years old, my late father, he passed away all of a sudden. Uh, and then, you know, uh, then the whole organization collapsed. You know, it's a little bit like if you read a little bit of history, you know, and then some some kind of power structure is so much centralized in a few people and the, when the few people is kind of tragic happens and everything collapses in a very short period of time. So I went from living like a prince as a Rinpoche, you know, a little bit like the legendary, you know, like the Kalu Rinpoche, very rich family, the very rich Rinpoche and whatever you call it, whatever you imagine it. It went from that to, uh, uh, how do you call it, a uh, little bit like a Rinpoche in the street, you know, <laughs> uh, because when people see weakness in your organization, they take advantage no matter what. So the first lesson is don't be compassionate. Don't be compassionate. You have to be tough. You know, you have to be, you know, you have to be tough. You have to hold your ground. That is very important in life. You cannot be, you know, show your weakness to other people. You know, you cannot be compassionate all the time. You have to hold your ground. And the only, you know, you have to practice compassion in your heart. You have to practice compassion in your heart but personality-wise, you have to hold your ground. That's the first lesson I understood in my life. <laughs> you know, because if you become, you know, lack of empathy and compassion from your heart also, then that makes you a very miserable person, a very selfish and very miserable person. So you cannot help other people, that's fine, that's temporary. But you have a responsible of your, all, your, of your own life, you know. So you have to practice compassion in your mind, like an example, the Cherizik practice like where you visualize the compassion of the six realms and, you know, uh, circulating with all the radiance. But, uh, you know, 
but in a real life, you have to hold your ground. You need to have a principle. So I went from being a Rinpoche that is slightly, not slightly, very spoiled, to to a Rinpoche who has absolutely nothing. You know, the monastery. You know, the monastery was belongs to the some group of people. The Dharma Center. We had more than 100 centers. So all the majority of the Dharma Center was like privatized for themselves with their own personal interest. You know, and then your whole you know, family took whatever they want for themselves. And so you're a little bit like, you know, a little bit like in a limbo, you know, a little bit like in a bardo. So I, ex I experienced the bardo bef before the bardo, you know. <laughs> you don't know where you are, what you're doing, what is the purpose of life. And then, you know, and then I was studying in another monastery for at least uh, from 1998 to 2008. I completed my three years retreat. During that time, you know, I was, uh, you know, I'd gone through a little bit of abuse, you know, uh, so there was a little bit of mental challenges that I had to go through during that time. Uh, and then, but still I carried on with my life. I never had this, you know, imagination of, um, of, uh, of, oh, you know, because people come to me and say that, oh, you're Kalu Rinpoche, you're a big master, but I don't feel that, you know. You feel slightly homeless, you know. So to that extent, it reached uh, in my life. And then when I went to the three years retreat, I was just, you know, expecting my traditional religious duties and nothing much. And then when I came out of the retreat, all of a sudden there were so many people who came and said, ah, now Kalurum, which she came out of three years retreat, you know, as if they have never left from the beginning, you know. Yeah. I was like, wow, what a, what a switch, you know. I became from absolutely nobody of completely forgotten to, you know, to the point that they're so desperate that they want me so much, you know. Then I was thinking, wow, it's too good to be true. You know, then I, I, I travel around the world, but each time I travel around the world, they want me to be the a Rinpoche, a little bit like a puppet, you know. They want you to say things in their benefit, and then whenever it comes to their property or the organization, in this off limit. You know, but they teach other people samaya, devotion, karmic, you know, but you're not allowed to say certain things. You know, to that extent, I, 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 I struggle a lot. But then I keep on pushing it. And, uh, you know, so now I oversee 46 meditation center. In the beginning, it was very difficult because when you are Rinpoche, you know, you had a monastic training, but you don't have a management training, you know. You're a little bit like, you do good. You do prayer, you know, be kind, put the bumpa in people's head, everything will be fine. You know, that's how you are brought up. But when, then when you enter to the real world, you know, it's not like that, you know. Uh, my, I receive equal advice from the lawyer as well as my guru, <laughs> <laughs> you know. So that, that sort of a harsh reality, you know, happened. And then I was going through a, a how do I say, um, how do you call it, a depression. Oh. You know, uh, a sense of hopelessness again and again. And then I became broke many times, you know, because you try to invest everything you got to the pillar of your organization. So you try to push forward as much as you can, you know. So there was a, you know, there was a point that I was eating, a, how do you call it? Uh, in, in Bhutan, you eat, you, you, you eat uh, coca, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> there was a point between 2013 and 14, I was eating YY, you know, uh, to that point. And because, uh, because all the centers, everybody want to hold it for themselves, you know, they don't want to support the monastery, you know, so then I had to reshuffle everything top to bottom, you know, and then you had to be logical, you have to be realistic, and at the same time, you had to be compassionate, you know, so you cannot be ruthless, you have to be compassionate, you have to be tolerant, you have to be reasonable, you know, so I think that is very important in life. No matter the status in life, you know, I think it's always good to be reasonable. It's always good to be compassionate. It's always good to be tolerant. Never lose your inner peace. Never lose your inner innocence, regardless of the external challenges and struggle. Always believe in the truth. And that is very important. No matter what, it will prevail. You know, so so that's that. And having a core principle in yourself is very important. Last yeah. uh, Again, this is a very humane question yes, to, yes. Uh, to a spiritual master. I, 
I think we have to ask ourselves, but then sometime asking Rimuchi will get more insights and mm. maybe more wisdoms from Hitler. Rimuchi, do you have fear? I do have fear, a lot of fear, a lot of paranoia, you know, uh, a lot of paranoia, a lot of fear, but how I cope is a different. You know, I'm, I'm not saying that, oh, look at me, I'm Rinpoche, I have no fear, I'm perfectionist. I'm not saying that. You know, I'm not perfect. I'm not a perfect human being. Uh, but I have a meaningful purpose in my life, you know, to do whatever I can to benefit others. And uh, yeah, there, there's constant fear here and there all the time, in different definition of fear as well. But, you know, uh, but I, o I overcome with the meditation and the practice and so on. Oh, Lesla. Yes, yes. So, in that sense, uh, Rimochen, would you like to uh, run down a little bit about how do you start your day mm. in terms of your practice and, mm -hmm. and uh, everything it, in between the days and how do you even end the day and retire to your sleep life? To be honest, I'm not going to start with I, I am sitting in the meditation box and you know, <laughs> doing the, the seven bowl offering in the morning That's and then I don't eat anything before the green tara prayers. I'm not going to say that. That's all. Okay. Uh, but you have done that one time, of course, of course. Yes, yes. yes I, when I was uh, 14 years old, I went to three years retreat mm -hmm. uh, and then I came out when I was 18 years old. Oh. Uh, so it was like three years and nine months of retreat, a solitary retreat. So that during that time, you know, it was very intensive. And the first year was terrible, you know. Everybody was doing a puja and prayer and I was just sleeping in the meditation box, you know. I was like, why am I here, you know? What is the purpose of my life, you know? The world is moving on and I'm left behind in this box. <laughs> what am I doing? I have the same view every day, you know. You have this uh, on the right side, on my left side, I have this little bit of hill with a little bit of bamboo, you know. And I see this view every day, and I'm <laughs> sick and tired of this view. <laughs> and, then, and then you know, you look at the, you look at all the Buddhas and Bodhisattva. You know, they look the same every day. You know, they are not talking to you, <laughs> they are not accompanying you. You know, and they're like, what am I doing with my life? You know, you you you, you know, you start to question you know yourself, and you know, because you're 14 years old, you know, like just before that, you had a little bit of laptop, a little bit of television, you know, walk up and so on, the FIFA cricket and so on. And then when you're in the, when you're in the retreat, you, you're a little bit isolated from it, you know. And you feel like the world is moving on and you are stuck in time. You know, it's, it's a terrible feeling. Uh, but starting from the second year and the third year, uh, you know, then I became more passionate with the yoga and the, reading the history of the different masters and so on. So, of course, you know, later on just became more dedicated. But in my life, it depends, you know, like if I'm doing a retreat with my students, mm. uh, you know, in the Dharma centers, in the monastery, then there's that routine, you know, where you wake up at a certain time. But in my personal life right now, you know, I just do my simple daily prayer, you know, do my push-up and exercise, running, you know, to be healthy physically and mentally both and do a little bit of meditation, read a little bit of books, and then scroll through Instagram and Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Who's saying what? Yeah. Last, last, yeah. Also, I learned that uh, uh, you also love nature, and you do chalkings, mm -hmm. you also do Facebook blogs, mm -hmm. and online teaching as well. And you are a very much a modern master in the sense. Yes. But at the same time, in this room, we have many uh, young friends who are called uh, entrepreneurs who mm. sell things, who create things. Mm. And uh, this is a time of entrepreneurs, they say. Nice and they end up making, creating space, creating products, mm. and changing the narrative of how society evolves forward. Mm. And these entrepreneurs, including myself, we used to, fear, we used to face a lot of fear, anxiety, mm. especially growing up. Mm. And even at this age, I'm almost 40. Nice I still have a fear and anxiety, you know, when I had to do something. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I'm back home, it, it's more easier to uh, stay out of that, mm -hmm. being connected to nature. Mm -hmm. But when you're in city and you have to deal every day with a lot of people, a lot of matters mm. here and there, I think we are constantly in stress. And uh, I think nature, for me, has really uh, given me a lot of stress reduction, for instance. Yes. So do you, do you have any uh, spiritual wisdom to share to us how nature plays a role in our everyday life? Mm. I think one is talking about the nature, 
uh, and then one is like because we have a lot of youth that who has imagination about the the metropolitan city. Oh, so yes. I think I have to explain a little bit of that. Please, sir. <laughs> you know, uh, without understanding the metropolitan city lifestyle, I don't think you will appreciate the nature. You know, uh, so like an example here, Temple. Yes, of course, it's a big city, but then there's other big cities around the world. You know, people are stressed out, have no sleep, no time to eat, no time to sleep, have to constantly work, you know, and constantly worrying, you know, uh, in their life and so on. And uh, that is the one way of living a life. I have no judgment towards it, you know. People have to survive whatever it takes mm. to benefit themselves, to provide to their family, and you should strive whatever you think that is a success in your mind, you know. So I'm not here to discourage however the the lifestyle that you want to lead, you know. Um, but eventually, you will come down to the point that you want to be a little bit content. You know, you will spend a lot of time buying material things here and there. You know, you will try to be cool, you will try to be fashionable, and here and there, you know, there will be a lot of things that you will be spending all your mind and energy on, which is nothing wrong. You should continue to do that, live your life the way you want. I have no judgment, you know. But time to time, you know, like yourself, you know, to, to go to the nature, I think is very important to to cleanse our mind, to re-energize ourselves, you know, to have a more clarity in our mind itself. You know, and the practice is that, you know, like I said before, reflecting the meaning of impermanence, because the nature is the very existence of the meaning of impermanence, and meditating with the thought of everything is impermanence, therefore everything is good, you know, with that phrase in your mind, then meditate a little bit, with a little bit of breathing exercise, you know, when you exhale through your nose, with the sensation from the nose coming, and then as you exhale, you know, keep your mind on the breath itself, as you inhale, you know, keep your mind to the breath itself, the sensation, and then as you repeat few times after that, then tell yourself everything is impermanent, therefore everything is perfect, you know. So meditating a little bit with that sort of a mental attitude is very much needed. Uh, yeah. Karchila, Karchila Mushi. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions here in the hall, anybody wants to ask anything? Please, any pressing? Ask, please, please ask any sort of question. There's no such thing as appropriate question. You know, I will not offend it. Please don't worry. You can raise your hand and you can ask. Hello. Yes. Oh, please. Uh, hello. Since no one's asking a, a question, uh, I've had the opportunity to probably ask this to Rinpoche. No. However, but for the benefit of everyone watching on social media and the people here, uh, so when I was there at the Fourth Vajrayana Buddhist Conference, it was very exciting to see you working with Dr. Ian Baker. Mm. Uh, after which, I followed up on the work he's doing. Mm. And so basically my question is, I want to know, uh, even while I was growing up, I think a lot of uh, Bhutanese young people probably struggle with it because we go to Western schools, uh, Western education, and we are basically embedded in the scientific method hmm. or the physics, chemistry, biology. Now very occasionally because of how we are practicing Buddhism hmm. in Bhutan or since 2,500 years, Buddhism has become this crazy tree which has around 38 subsects and there are so many different forms and rituals embedded within it. So I, as a Rinpoche, as a modern practitioner, I see you working with Dr. Ian Baker. Hmm. So I really want to know how has your experience been in terms of bridging uh, Buddhist, Buddhism, Buddhist principles and the scientific method. Because very occasionally, even within my own life, I'm constantly either debating, discussing, arguing or offending people sometimes. Hmm. Uh, because uh, I'm coming with a very scientific uh, method mind. Mm. I value Buddhism, I believe in Buddhism, mm -hmm. but at that same time, I take to heart what Buddha said, mm -hmm. and he said, question everything. Mm -hmm. So coming from that, I find a lot of resonance between the scientific method and Buddhism, but I want to hear from Rinpoche personally in your experience of uh, Buddhism, how have you bridged that divide that seemingly exists in a lot of people's mind, the separation between spirituality and science. Mm. Thank you. Science, the word of science is a very big topic, you know. There's a science in the different categories 
of studies and research and so on. So I will not say that I, I know everything, you know. Uh, what I can say is that, you know, like an example, the Buddha Shakyamuni himself, he said, the question everything, don't follow just because I simply say so, you know. Uh, so therefore, we should question everything. But that should be also balanced with your inner quality as well. You know, if you question everything, every time, that will also not become a conclusive result to yourself or in your life. You know, so sometimes it's good to question. Sometimes let the practice, what you have accumulated, let that be the answer to yourself. That should be the, 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 the method to overcome your doubt, to overcome your question. So that should be a two-way. You know, one is literally asking questions and debating, and one is doing practice, retreat, solitary, whether it's three years, whether it's one day. You know, even you do a one-day retreat, that's still a solitary retreat. You don't have to go in a cave, you know, unless you want to impress everybody, then, then that's not my business, you know. But then if you don't want to impress anybody, if you simply want to focus on developing a quality, you lock the door in your apartment, that became a retreat. You know, as long as your mind is not traveling around, as long as you have a continuation of awareness, you are in the retreat. Retreat does not define in the have to be in the cave, or have to be in a very dangerous place where nobody comes. It doesn't have to be that. The retreat can be anywhere, long as you have a continuation of awareness with a pure intention, and that's the retreat. And you should question everything to a certain extent. The certain extent of the questions you should develop by yourself, as well as answering by yourself, combining with the practice. So that's that. Now the, the, the other part is that I, myself, with the Niguma Yoga, you know, which I have performed during the Vajrayana conference, my idea with the Ian Baker is to, uh, to examine in a medical perspective. So when you make a, how do I say, physical movement from here to there, you know, and when you move your body, keep the air here in the diaphragm, and what kind of a chemical releases from your brain, you know, what does it affect, and then the blood circulation with a certain movement that goes through all your body, you know. So I am focusing on a traditional medicinal approach as well as a Western approach, and then my, uh, how do I say, my personal approach. So three elements combined together, because I believe in that approach, because you cannot impose on other people saying that my religion is good, because that idea of my religion is good existed throughout this history uh, of the civilization. You know, Christians have done that before. You know, paganism, uh, you know, they have done that. The, the Greek, you know, their own belief in religion, they have done that as well. You know, so that kind of approach and imposing a religion to other people, saying this should be the only solution for you, should be never be the method, but rather be a choice for let people can pick and practice and utilize with their own decision. You know, so so that is very important. You know, if you impose on other people saying my religion is good, my teaching is good, I'm your guru then you are basically suffocating people in the long run, and that is not helpful either, you know. And then the, the, the final point is that sometime let the quality speak itself instead of answering everything, you know. So if you are a practitioner, you know, continuously over the time, the quality will speak by itself in other people. Like an example, when you see the Buddha Shakyamuni, you know, due to his realization, you can see the inner quality from the external as well, you know. So sometimes, not to answer everything, sometimes let the quality speak by itself is also the solution, you know. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Larimbochi. Thank yeah. you, Sangye. Uh, we have another question from the audience here, Rinpoche. Yes, please. You have a mic here. No, you, there's a mic coming towards you. Um, firstly, I would like to thank uh, Rinpoche for giving this opportunity. Yeah. Uh, this is my second time. I have attended uh, Niguma Yoga with Rinpoche. It was yeah. an honor. Yeah. Uh, I just have a few questions. After attending that, uh, uh, I went back and I tried to practice. Um, 
But I really found uh, some fundamental skills very challenging, especially yeah. the lipping one. <laughs> I tried, and uh, I was wondering if there is an astra, I mean, uh, like a process that I need to follow, mm. you know, to reach to that level, like how Rinpoche performed, mm -hmm. and that's one thing. Another thing is. Um, uh, you, in Bhutan, like the yoga has become very popular, mm. and sometimes I'm very skeptical with the essence being lost mm -hmm. because any like you know for face yoga, hair yoga, there are so many yogas which I think that's not the very, really like uh, rational behind. There mm. are different uh, aspects that actually I, I connect yoga to spirituality, but sometimes people take it as an aerobic kind of thing to lose their weight and all. So. I was very happy that the Nigumma Yoga is being introduced to Bhutan, but mm. I'm also with a question, uh, being in Buddhist country where certain things are restricted, in the sense it's kept sacred, and uh, I, I just wonder how we can break the mindset of uh, the people, especially, um, uh, you know, monks, I would say, <laughs> in Bhutan. Mm. Uh, when I showed those uh, practices that Rinpoche, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I mean, exhibited, they say that this is very, like, sacred and it's not allowed kind of thing, which mm. I disagree, actually. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I'm just uh, having a question, how, like, we can, you know, break that mindset, la. that's uh, one thing. Mm. And I've got third, uh, not a question, but is a suggestion. Mm. Uh, we have many Bhutanese who are very interested to take Nigumma Yoga to next level, mm -hmm. not for anybody, but our own spiritual awakening. So I would like to have, uh, I mean, opportunities with Rinpoche online or anywhere. Like I think there are many Bhutanese. So is there any plan such, uh, like for you know online sessions or something like that? Like, mm. So these are three things. Like. No, sir. Uh, number one is that uh, I will do the Nigumma Yoga session. Um, next time when I come to Bhutan, which is around the end of February, you know, so the end of, uh, end of like, let's say next month, you know, like end of February, I will be here. So during that time, then I will be doing the Niguma Yoga, because the last time it was at the, you know, CBS, you know, uh, it's, it, so I just wanted to be a little bit more respectful, and this time is more informal, you know, so that we can have an open conversation like that. So that's number one. Number two is that, you know, to make a progress uh, within the yoga posture, it will take time, you know, whether I'm here with you <laughs> today or whether I'm here with you tomorrow, doesn't matter, it will take time. Uh, like an example, you know, myself, I have done uh, 725 sessions within the six months, you know, so each day I do like six, six sessions, five sessions, and that is equivalent to two times of three years retreat, you know, of the accumulation of the session. Uh, so, you know, so I did a lot of intensive training and then, of course, I refine, 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 you know, over the stages. Uh, so that's that. Now, coming down to, you know, some uh, individuals and monks who, who disagrees with you, uh, my approach is very simple. Um, and that is, you have to understand the, the origin of the yoga, you know, uh, because like the Niguma Yoga itself, she herself, you know, there's a different kind of yoga. I cannot speak on, on the behalf of the Naro Yoga or the Nyingma or the Sacha or Geluk or Chona or other tradition. I cannot say they should be opening to people. I cannot demand that. That's not my responsibility. You know, like an example, Dupakaju, you know, it's an official religion. Whatever they like to do, that is their decision. But in my lineage, I'm the head of my own lineage, so I can decide. And I do not decide just because that I think, you know, it's a good idea. Uh, I read in the history, everybody who has a basic understanding about the Niguma history, they know that. She have mentioned very clearly that my teachings, she said, my dear child, I give you these teachings of the Niguma, mm -hmm. you know, uh, during the daytime, as well as in the state of the dream. You have to uphold this teaching until the seventh generation. So from her until the seventh generation, this teaching is prohibited uh, from sh to share to anybody or to show or demonstrate to anybody. You will get punishment for that, karmic punishment. Uh, so until to, to that extent, you have to keep it. So that the lineage of the secrecy maintained for the seventh generation of the lineage uh, holder and then after that, it was given to the public, you know. So, 
by the time it became public, it was already around like the 13th century. You know, so then the Shangpa lineage and the Niguma yoga practice, it became so popular uh, throughout the Himalaya region. It stretched all the way to Nepal, to China, Bhutan, Tibet, and so on. You know, but um, now it comes down to the, uh, the other side of the historical event that you have to understand. Like the concept of the tam, right? The concept of the three years and three months is a relatively new invention. It's not ancient as we think, you know, because when we when we see a little bit rusted statue, you know, they say, ah, oh, that's an antique statue. You know, we don't question anything. Yeah, but the origin of the three years retreat is relatively new. It's only a few hundred years, you know. But it doesn't mean that Tampa did not exist before that, you know. Like an example, the Milarepa was the retreat for his whole life. Many great masters they were retreat, and they were living as a retreat master the whole life. They come time to time to the village to give some blessing, to do prayer. And sometimes some of these great masters, they don't even want to interact with anybody. You know? And due to that, some lineage went to extinction mm. as well. You know? So there's different element to that. So therefore, uh, when one started to do this concept of three years retreat, then the many different traditions started to do this, the, the concept of three years and three months. Nobody became enlightened by doing a three years and three months retreat. It is just simply an experiment, we call it. You know, even when we enter the retreat, when we are about to finish the retreat, even in the teachings it says, this is not accomplishment. This is just the beginning. Your retreat is your life. What you do here is an is a experiment, understanding your limitation, understanding your capacity, establishing a foundation, and then so that if you choose to practice one day or any particular practice, not all of it, then you can do it for the rest of your life. You know? So doing retreat is not accomplishment. You know? uh, so that's, that's that. You know? so, uh, and of course, due to the Himalaya mountain border, you know, that yoga became more monastic rather than, uh, rather than just a simply physical aspect of the practice. You know, so that's the one thing. Then other thing is that the reason why I'm trying to promote yoga is that because we need a big push. You know, otherwise, you know, everything becomes analytical approach, you know, mental practice and so on. You know, so in the in the Vajrayana Buddhism we need to have a big push. Like an example, different religion, they do a lot of charity work, they do humanitarian work, they do a lot of social work. And they also do medicinal approach. They do also a yoga approach. So we Buddhism, we need a yoga approach to people who are not so interest, not so much interested in Buddhism, but who already question the existence of their life, the existence existence of the suffering, want to discover a little bit in themselves. And the yoga is the perfect practice where you can say you can feel much more in yourself rather than just being living in the idea of happy and unhappy, sad and miserable, angry. And all these are limited emotions, you know. We can experience far more, you know, when we do a proper yoga. You know, so if they want to do a yoga to the point just to bring themselves a joy, they can do that. I have no judgment, you know. If they want to switch that practice into the practice in the dharmic way, they can also do that. Mm. But what it does to your chemical in your brain is that, you know, you have all the serotonin chemical, it releases. You know, like an example, the first few posture of the yoga, it's simply, you know, uh, releasing adrenaline in your body. You know, like an example, you're a little bit sleepy, you're a little bit tired, you're not really motivated. So a few certain movement in the beginning, it just gives you the adrenaline rush so that your mind become like that, like completely awakened. And then the few stages of the posture, it releases the chemical and the whole blood flow in your body. You know, so you know. So if you are just simply a non-Buddhist, you can experience the how do I say the chemical releasing in your brain. You know, where you can just simply enjoy that moment and be happy. Or if you are a Buddhist practitioner, you can switch that into a non-duality meditation, which is emptiness or Mahamudra, whatever you call it. You know. So that's my 
I, w- I was worried. I was worried a lot in the beginning. I was prepared of the criticism, you know, to be thrown under the rug. You know, I knew the consequences. You know, but when you look at the bigger picture, I'd rather take the risk. Of you know, yeah, it's much more important than my existence. You know, so so that's that. Mm-hmm. So we have uh, uh, a cultural program line up, but before that, uh, may I ask you again uh, what Dicky from the audience has asked? Yes. So over the time, do you have any plan to have maybe uh, a, a particular place where the Niguma Yoga fans can mm-hmm. come and practice and learn? Mm-hmm. And do you have any plans to do maybe training of trainers, something like that? So I'm really trying to share with you a very modern perspective of approaching this, mm-hmm. what generally the the people are approaching to yoga. La. Mm-hmm. You see, you know, that about the yoga itself, I'm not trying to put myself as a guru. And that's a very important thing. That's okay. Because many people, they put themselves in, in, into this idea of that I am the guru, you are my student. And you should listen to what I say and you should not question my authority. Mm. And, you know, in the traditional Buddhist you know, society. And that will backfire in the long run, you know, because you cannot uh, control people's emotion just like that, you know. You have to help them, you have to heal them, Bless. you have to be tolerant to them, you have to be compassionate to them. Mm. You cannot bring a judgment idea into how and when and how they should behave in the front of you because they are guru, uh, they are, that you are their guru. You know, you should not never obligate to other people to think of yourself, you know, to see them as a guru, but rather rather help them, heal them, you know, and then they will see you as a guru eventually by itself, naturally, no matter what. But imposing on other people saying that now I teach this Dharma, now I teach this yoga, therefore I'm your guru, therefore you're my student, that approach is very unhealthy in the long run. Lassola. You know, so I when whenever some people when they say, Kalamashi, I would like to be your student and can you be my guru? And I say to them, the first step is that you stay away from me. You know, <laughs> stay away from me. What you need to learn is the Dharma teaching itself, not my personality. I'm my personality, my character. I'm not equal to the Buddha. You know, but there's a certain teachings that I understood a little bit better. I can provide. I can share. So that sort of a principle in yourself is very important from yourself and from myself equally. That's you know, so regarding the yoga itself, uh, definitely. Uh, next time, it will be definitely in Timpu. So Lassula. it's more convenient for people. It won't be in the temple. It will be more like in the public hall, just like this, so people can feel comfortable. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, thank you for the wonderful questions. We will break one time for the, uh, the culture program. We have lined up here. And I hope you guys will enjoy. And you can also sing together with this beautiful lady here. And uh, yes, la. that's it for now. May I say thank you to them? Uh, we haven't. We are not concluding yet. Mm. But even after the program, we will again come back for maybe some more questions and then.